Hello, Tito Jeff here in Ormark City, Leyte, the Philippines. Welcome to my channel. And uh, I haven't posted much in about the last year, uh, but I've been here two years now. Two years on April 6th. So I'm going to talk about my experience here, a little bit uh, history of what I've been through and uh, what I've learned and maybe how I can help you a little bit if you're interested in coming to the Philippines. So I came uh, in April of 2022. We, uh, I had met Maricel, my, my wife now, online, January 10th, 2020. Uh, I visited in March of 2022, 2020, I'm sorry, 2020. I met Maricel here in the Philippines. Went home and it was locked down, so I didn't get to see her for two years. Uh, except online, we had a long distance relationship on Facebook Messenger. And uh, we applied for a K-1 visa, and that was going okay. Uh, but Maricel ran into problems with uh, applying for a passport. Turned out she had applied for one before, but she forgot about it. So the DFA, the Department of Foreign Affairs here in the Philippines, wanted to know why she wanted another passport. So, uh, and she was applying again, and then they noticed on her application, uh, her name was spelled differently than on the first one and some things like that. So she had to get a correction on her birth certificate, the spelling of her name, and the location of her birth. So we did that. Uh, well, we did that after I came here. So she ran into that problem and she kind of got frustrated and she wanted to give up. She didn't want to come to America anymore. So I said, well, then I'll just come to the Philippines. I'll retire early. Uh, I had a good job and I saved us a lot of money. and. Only about a year, less than a year away from uh, early retirement with Social Security. So I came to the Philippines in April. I uh, came during a uh, typhoon. Also, I had to have a certificate showing that I had passed a COVID test before I could come into the Philippines. I had to be within 24, 48 hours, 72 hours, I think, of my boarding my flight to come to the Philippines. And I had that, I had two copies. Got all the way to Incheon, South Korea, boarded the plane from Manila. I was cooking with grease. I was ready to come to the Philippines. Got to the Philippines and I had lost the, the COVID test. So I'm in five days in quarantine. So I five days in quarantine. And then uh, had a little trouble there with cash. Didn't get enough cash when I went to the hotel because there was no, no room service. And then, uh, Got out of there and went to Cebu City to meet Maricel and her mother, but they couldn't come because uh, the ocean was rough and uh, because of the hurricane. So finally, nine days later, I made it to Ormoc City, where I currently live. We bought a house. We did renovations. And here's the progress on the septic tank. So it's raining now. The guys are still working. This is Jacinto, my brother-in-law. Uh, we got married. We went on our honeymoon to uh, Bohol and uh, visited the Chocolate Hills. And we had a great time there. It's a nice place to go visit if you ever want to go to a nice resort island. There's lots to do there. And uh, we had a nice honeymoon uh, in September. We got married in July. September, she was pregnant. And we've had a baby in April this last year. He's one year old this month. His name is JJ, Jeffrey Jr. There he is. He's a handsome, smart little boy. Uh, perfect in every way but I'm not biased. So we've had a good life here, a good life so far. We bought a car, and I bought a car, I already had a multi-cab, 
It's called a Suzuki Scrub. Here's a picture. And um, so since I've been here, I've been using my savings. I've still got savings left. I've got my Social Security. We will soon be receiving a benefit for my son, which will help us out tremendously. And we have a good life here. Financially, we, we, are, we are sound. But uh, we've also reapplied now. We canceled the fiancé visa that we were applying for. And then in January 2023, we applied for a spousal visa, CR1. It will be now. It will be an IR one because we've been married for. By the time it's approved, we will be, have been married by, for two years. And there's a difference there. Uh, the CR one and IR one. Uh, IR one's a little better for getting a green card immediately when you come to the United States. So, uh, to move to America, it's going to cost us about twenty thousand dollars for the three of us. It'll be at least two thousand. For plane tickets. Uh, we'll have to have a ferry ride to Cebu and a taxi and maybe a hotel, so maybe maybe more than that. Let's and I, I didn't count JJ's ticket. He, he's right if he gets there before he's before he's two years old, I think the plane ticket is only about ten percent of an adult price. So maybe more. So maybe twenty five hundred dollars for airfare. When we get to Kentucky, I'm gonna have to rent a car. I'll have to have that for I don't know how long. So I'm budgeting $500 for a rental. We'll have to stay in a hotel for probably a week until we get an apartment and I'll start looking for a job. So that'll be you know, another 500 bucks at least. We'll have to buy furniture once we get an apartment. So that's going to be at least $2,500. And then um, what else? We'll have to have new phone service. We might have to buy new phones. Um, We'll have to have a car, at least one, for a while, and two, eventually, because well, you know, it's in America. You gotta have. You really need two cars. And um, what else? Well, some uh, miscellaneous items. We gotta stock up on groceries and uh, things like that. So it's gonna cost us at least twenty thousand dollars to relocate. Uh, so my plan is to go back here this, this year, 2024. Uh, we won't be going to America for another year. It'll be at least another year, maybe May or June of 2025. So to uh, help us defray those costs, those moving expenses, I'm going to go back to America this summer and get a job and save some money. And the way I'm going to do that, I'm going to go live in St. Louis. I have a friend there. I can rent a room in his house for 400 bucks a month, live on peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, and get a job and save some money. And I could probably come home with another $7,000 saved. And there's a limit on how much I can earn now since I'm on Social Security and took early retirement. The earnings limit for me will be $22,320. So I think within six months I can probably make that limit, working overtime or working more than one job. Yeah, it's not going to be you know high-paying jobs. It's going to be working at Home Depot or something. Like that. So I'm going to go do that. Get back probably by Christmas, and then uh, another six months later, we will be headed to America. And that's been a difficult process. We did have to get some corrections to her birth certificate. So even if our visa was approved right now, we couldn't go because she doesn't have a passport. Um, like I said, we went to the she went to the DFA. Apply for a passport, they noticed some discrepancies. So uh, as soon as I got here in the Philippines, uh, 2022, after we got married, I said, let's let's work on that. So we did, and we got some corrections made to her birth certificate. And once we got those back, it took about a year. Let's go to DFA and apply for your passport. Well, we've been married by then. We had a marriage certificate. And... Uh, so we put incorrect birthplace on our marriage certificate. So that's wrong. And then uh, on her birth certificate, it has her father's name spelled as Bernardino. And so we have to get that corrected on the birth certificate and on our marriage certificate. 
So we did so so many of those corrections in January. It'll be at least June, and it might not be till the end of the year before we get those back from the Philippines Statistics Authority, which issues birth certificates, marriage certificates, things like that. So we got to get that done. Well, we've approved for the well, we, again, we do that. We applied in January 2023 for the for the spousal visa. My petition. So the first thing that you have to do is the the American spouse has to petition the United States government, Customs and Immigration Service, for a visa for my wife. My petition has been approved. They send that to the National Visa Center in New Hampshire, and the National Visa Center will ask you to pay another fee. It's about $500, I think. $445, I think, maybe, something like that. So it's uh, not cheap, and you supply them with her um, birth certificate, her marriage certificate, her passport, her police report, and I have to submit an affidavit of support. So two different things. And uh, so we've submitted that. Now it takes another at least 10 months. Well, it takes about six weeks to two months for that to be processed and approved. Once that's approved, you're called documentarily qualified or DQ'd. Once you're DQ'd, it takes about another five or six months, and then they will send that to the Embassy of Manila, and then you might be another five or six months before you get an interview. I don't know. It's a long process. So we're doing that. So uh, that's where we are now, here in the, in the Philippines. And uh, since we bought our house, we, like I said, we did renovations, and we did some additions. I'll show you some pictures of that. So now we have a nice house. Uh, we don't want to leave it, really. We like it. Uh, my plan was to sell it when we move to America so we have extra cash when we get there. Maybe to buy a house in America or if she decides to stay, we will have a house here in the Philippines to dispose of. So, um, but we're, we decide to keep it. She really doesn't want to sell it. She likes our little house. And uh, I do too. But, uh, so we'll keep it, and some of her family will stay here when we go to visit America. Our plan is to stay about five years and return. Five years because if she lives in America for five years, then she becomes eligible to receive my Social Security benefit and any benefit that she may be entitled to uh, if she works in America. She's entitled to my benefit, half of it, at when she reaches age 60. And by the time she reaches age 60, she's 39 now. That'll be another 21 years. I'm 63. I'm not sure I'll be around. So it might be good timing for her to be able to receive that. So five years would be a good time to stay there, let her experience America, and then come back. And our son would be about seven years old and not so old that it would scar him for life if we moved back to the Philippines. So that's our plan. Now, my experiences here in the Philippines have been just about what I expected because I had I've been talking to her online for two years. I knew what her life was like. I, knew, I visited the Philippines. I watched a lot of videos from other expats. And uh, you, know, you get lots of different viewpoints from different expats. So, and I understood that. That helped because not everybody sees the Philippines the same way. So, but I did learn some things here. One, driving. That's my biggest headache here in the Philippines, driving a car. Uh, there aren't really any rules. There's no rules. Everybody has the right of way, and nobody has the right of way. Here in Orbach City, a city of about 220,000 people, there's not one stoplight. Now, in Cebu City and Manila, we have stoplights. Uh, and I've been there, and people do obey the, the traffic lights in those cities. Here we have stop signs. Nobody knows. They couldn't tell you where a stop sign is here. So everybody kind of goes through the intersections uh, without stopping unless somebody's in their way. And most of the time that's not too bad. It's uh, people kind of cr cr crawl through the intersections if there's a lot of traffic. And they'll help each other get through and it's, it's, they're polite to each other and it's, it's not that bad. But it can, be, it can be a real headache, especially when you first get here and first start driving. I met one couple here from 
Uh, they moved here from America. Husband is American, and wife Filipino, and uh, they plan to come back here and, and, and stay. And they were headed back to America. And that was one of the reasons, because of the driving. Uh, the other was they had trouble building a house, and it was going to cost more than they thought, and take longer. Some other issues. They just they were. His wife got comfortable living in America, and he was missing it, so they're going to go back to America. Um, driving, it's very hard. I did was able to get my Philippine driver's license. I converted my Kentucky license to a Philippine license. It took me about an hour and a half. For my wife to get a driver's license, it was a big hassle. She had to get a learner's permit. She had to go to a driving school for an eight-hour seminar. And then she had to take eight hours of driving lessons. You know, a lot of times, you go to these schools, because we did the same thing for her brother, wanted to get his uh, motorcycle license. He'd been driving without one. And uh, he had to go to the same thing, seminar. And they printed out the certificate while we were there and gave it to us. Seminar on Saturday, if you'd like to come. So he didn't have to go, so he didn't. And then, uh, you know, driving kiss. Uh, we went to uh, another location here in the island of Leyte, another city, and I think we just kind of had that fixer and somebody paid somebody and no driving test involved, and he got his license. So that's one of the reasons bad driving is so bad here, because people don't have to pass any kind of test. They don't have to learn any rules, really, to get a license. So Marisol had to do that. This is kind of a ripoff too, I think. To get her permit, she had to have a medical exam. That's the same thing you do in America, but you do it at the courthouse, or wherever you get your license. It's mostly, I, can you read this sign? Uh, are you colorblind? Do you have depth perception? It's not an in-depth eye exam. It's just enough to see if you can drive. And, and uh, they asked her what her blood pressure, they didn't examine her, they asked her what her blood pressure was. Do you have any trouble with blood pressure? No. So that cost not much, it's about $6. Got her permit, went back to get her license. She had to do the medical exam again, 30 days later. And while it's not much for me, 350 pesos, I think, it's a lot for a Filipino who's making only about 350 to 500 pesos a day. It's expensive, but, and uh, it's hard on Filipinos here sometimes, the way they make their rules. Um, excuse me, I had to cough, I had to edit that out. So, um, the other thing is how to get things done here in the Philippines. Don't go to the courthouse and expect things to be done the same way as they are in America. Things take time here. They got their rules and they follow the rules. But what I found out, if you go to the courthouse and you have trouble navigating their rules, people at the courthouse are very happy to help you and they will work to help people here. So it took me a while to figure that out, but to notice what they were doing. Uh, but it's, it's really, really nice. A lot of nice people here try, try to help you. But you have to be patient. You have to wait in line a lot here. Uh, if I go to pay my water bill, you don't pay it by mail. Um, you can pay it online with GCash, I guess, but I, don't, I haven't done that yet. So I have to go to City Hall to pay my water bill. And sometimes there might be three people waiting out in five minutes. Sometimes there might be 30 people waiting. And it takes me about a half an hour to sit and wait. One advantage I have, though, is I'm old. I'm 63. They have a line for seniors, persons with disabilities, and pregnant women. That line is shorter, so I always get in that line. <laughs> and uh, I get done a little faster. But you have to wait. There's no air conditioning. They have electric fans, but no air conditioning. Um, so anything that like, you have to do like that at City Hall, even when you go pay the uh, electric bill or you go pay it uh, at a, a kind of, it's called my, uh, Bayad Center, uh, Bayad means to pay, and you can pay your bills there, uh, and you have to wait in line. Waiting in line at the grocery store. Uh, there's no conveyors. They do have scanners at checkouts, but it takes longer. They do things a little differently. They bag your groceries for you 
Uh, you'll take the soap, uh, dish soap, laundry soap, whatever you have. You'll put it in a separate paper bag. You then put that in your bag. So if it spills, it doesn't get all over the place. Little things like that, little details that make things take a little longer at the grocery store. Speaking of the grocery store, we go to a supermarket. It's a nice place. It's got air conditioning. It's really nice. Uh, but it's here in this in Ormoc, um, maybe in Manila you have bigger and better things. But here in Ormoc, it's the biggest store in town, uh, other than the SM, SM, and that means Save More uh, Grocery. It's, a, it's another shopping mall, two shopping malls. But they don't always have what you want. Uh, if I go one week and I buy bacon, the next week I may not have any. Uh, I may go and buy my to, to buy my favorite bread. None on the shelf. Not available. You hear that a lot here in the Philippines. Not available, sir. Not in stock. Um, if you like jelly or jam, you like you, you learn to like a favorite jam here that may not have it on on the shelf. Things like that. We do have. Uh, their own brands here, jellies and jams, which are just fine, different flavors. They don't have grape jelly. And if you have to have grape jelly, and uh, you can't get Smuckers, even though they do have Smuckers, then don't come to the Philippines and cry. So, um, they, they don't have good steaks at the grocery store. They have some, but they're really thin, frozen. The meat department is different here. The way they cut their chicken up is different. Um, just not always, uh, everything's not always available, and you won't find a, a lot of American brands here. You find some, but they, sometimes they're very expensive. Just a can of Campbell's chicken noodle soup it might be three or four dollars, or it's you know, less than a dollar at home. Um, but you find things that, that you do like here that are good. So, driving, learning to be patient with people here when you're transacting any kind of business, and um, being patient in traffic, patience, 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 patience in the Philippines. Learning to enjoy uh, people here and making friendships. Uh, people are very nice here. They love my son. We go, uh, for instance, we went to Cebu City, stayed in the Crown Regency Hotel. And uh, they had a breakfast buffet. We went to the breakfast buffet. And Marcel was trying to hold the baby and eat, which is not easy. And uh, the, the young ladies that were attending to the buffet were making eyes at our baby and flirting with him. Because there weren't a lot of customers. Uh, that's another story. But they didn't have a lot of customers, so they had a lot of time to flirt with JJ. So I said, you want to hold him? They said, yeah. So these four Filipinas held my baby and passed him around, and Mama got to eat breakfast. And he had a big time. He, he's a very friendly little boy. He loves uh, people, and, and you don't let anybody hold him. So uh, what else was I going to talk about? I've got a list here. I've been in the hospital a couple of times since I've been here in the Philippines. I previously made a video. Ask somebody, you know, how much should you have, uh, how much money do you need to retire in the Philippines? And I talked about our budget. And uh, that's changed since we have a son now. And I'll do another budget video. But you need some savings when you come here. Don't come here on um, $1,200 a month early retirement and think you're going to make it here. It's, it's hard on that much. It's, it's good, actually. It's a good income. You'll be rich here in the Philippines, but you'll run into problems. Uh, if you don't have any savings, or if you just have a little bit, it won't, it won't take long to go through it. Um, things, hospital. You, know, you have to pay at the hospital. You have to pay cash. If you come here to stay, you can get Phil Health if you're married. Um, and Phil Health is a national insurance program. It's more like a discount card. So it pays for hospitalization, it doesn't pay for any prescriptions, it doesn't pay for doctor visits, just for hospitalization. And you get a discount. 
You might need to also get a 20% senior discount at some hospitals. And uh, PhilHealth, combine, combine that with PhilHealth, PhilHealth will be about 20, anywhere from 20 to 30% discount. And they're getting ready to increase the benefits, so maybe that'll help more. But you have to pay up front sometimes. Uh, I had to have an angiogram. I had to leave Ormoc and go to Cebu City to Chonghua Hospital, a very modern hospital. And they had uh, the ability to do an angiogram, which is where you run a tube. They went up through my arm here, all the way into my heart, injected a dye, and took pictures of my heart vessels, blood vessels, to see if I had any blockages. Fortunately, I don't have any major blockages. I do have some micro arteriosclerosis. So you have the, the little tiny capillaries around your heart. Some of those are blocked. So uh, to do that, I had to be prepared to have a stent also. If, I, if they found a major blockage, they would want to put a stent in my artery to hold it open and to clear it out. And uh, I, I wanted to have that done. I don't want a blockage, so I had to go prepared for that. So the cost for the stent would be about 400,000 pesos, which would be about uh, 100,000 pesos is about $2,000, about $8,000 for the procedure. Uh, fortunately, I didn't need to spend that much. I didn't have a blockage. And the procedure itself was only about $80,000. I think, And they did another one there, Paul was there, did also did an aortogram. So I took a picture of my aorta all the way down through my body cavity to my legs. And uh, everything is okay there, fortunately. So I um, had a nice cardiologist that attended me. He was a teaching doctor. Uh, it's a teaching hospital. So... Um, I was, and he had he had studied in America, worked many years in America as a cardiologist, and a good trainer. I was very confident in, in his ability. So, but you have to. I had to pay. I think half of that up front. I had to give like a two hundred thousand peso deposit or something like that. Maybe maybe a hundred hundred and fifty thousand. I can't remember. But a big deposit. I had to go ready to pay that, and. Uh, so if you want to go to the hospital here, you got to have some cash. And um, to go to the doctor, you got to have cash. I see a cardiologist. It's not much. It's only about $10, 500 pesos here. But again, that's a lot of money for a Filipino. So relatively speaking, for me, it's not much. For a Filipino, it's very expensive. Um, another thing, my cardiologist can do an echocardiogram in her office. No, not, not echo, electrocardiogram. So and that costs a little more. So if I have one of those when I'm here, it's about 900 pesos, $18. Uh, I have good health care here. Uh, I like my cardiologist. She's very smart. Uh, she's seen some things in me here that weren't noticed in America. And, uh, she's taking good care of me. So I've been in the hospital twice, once for gastroenteritis, not long after I arrived, and you know, I was working on the renovation of the house. I was in the hospital for four days. It was about 100,000 pesos, $2,000. Once again, in, uh, for, for atrial fibrillation. I have had atrial fibrillation twice that I know of in my life. First time, right after I came to visit the Philippines, I went home, and uh, I won't go into the details of that, but that's, that was the first time. Then again here, and uh, went to a regular checkup for my doctor. I didn't realize it was an AFib. She said, you need to go to the hospital, and we'll treat you for this. And so they did. They treated me chemically with uh, medicines instead of a cardio inversion. In America, I had uh, an electric shock to my heart that shocked me back in rhythm. So as a result of that, then she wanted me to go to Cebu City to have the angiogram. It's to check the health of my heart. So, uh, you have to buy drugs at the hospital. Sometimes at the hospital pharmacy. Sometimes they don't have the medication. So you have to have someone with you uh, that, so that they can go out and purchase medications if you need them. Uh, they have to bring you water to drink. They don't give you drinking fluids in, in the hospital. Um, and other things that you might need. So you have to have someone with you at the hospital at all times. Uh, prescriptions. I pay cash for prescriptions. That's one of my biggest living expenses here. 
is prescriptions. I take about three different blood pressure medications. I take the cholesterol medication now, and uh, I'm taking an allergy pill. Been having trouble with allergies a little bit and triggering some phlegm and things, and I've had uh, trouble with that. And uh, but that's it. You have to pay cash. Sometimes you go to the drugstore and they don't have what you want. You have to go to another drugstore. Well, I've kind of figured out the, the best drugstore to go to here in Ormoc to buy things. So, what else are we going to talk about? We, hospital, renovation, honeymoon. Uh, JJ was born in the hospital. His mo mama had to have a cesarean section. We had to pay a deposit before they would take her into surgery. Uh, they do things differently. I was not allowed to be in the, in the room during the birth because they, they just don't have the facilities for it. We have bought a car since we moved here. I had a multi-cab when I came here, Suzuki Scrub. There it is. It's a little four-wheel drive truck with a three-cylinder engine, four on the floor, no power steering, no air conditioning, no heat, no need of heat here in the Philippines. It's a good little truck, and uh, I've been doing some of my own mechanic work on that, most of it. And uh, revived my mechanic skills since I've been here. And uh, once I decided to go to America and work this summer, and now that I have a baby, I wanted Marcel to have a car that she could drive that would be easier to drive. I did teach her how to drive the multi-cab, manual transmission, no power steering. She learned how to drive it, and uh, I'm proud of her for that. <laughs> yes, yes, go, go. But that would be difficult for her with a baby. Uh, not a good place to put a car seat in there. So we got a little Toyota uh, Wigo. W I G O. Toyota Wigo. Actually manufactured by Daihatsu in the country of Indonesia for most originally for the Indonesian market. Toyota has an agreement to market this under their name as the Wego. Little three cylinder also, uh, front wheel drive, air con, power steering, all the niceties and it's easy for her to drive and it's a good little car for, for driving around the island here. So we bought that and uh, immediately had some problems with it. The guy I bought it from uh, had it started when I went to look at it. It was already running. The air con was going. Oh, that's nice. And uh, I took took it for a test drive and Marcel liked it. So we, yeah, we'll buy it. I, like, I know something about mechanic work. And I noticed they had a problem with a left rear hub grinding a little bit, so it was going to need a bearing, I could do that, and uh, the transmission fluid was a little dirty, so I said, I can get that changed. Not a big deal, but I didn't see much else wrong with it. Got home the next day, started out cold, put it in reverse, and blah, 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 like it's going to die. And uh, put it in park, rev the engine for a little bit, a little while, and that, got, and that went away. But then also we had trouble with it. Uh, check engine light came on flashing one day after we'd been driving quite a bit that day. And we got home. And, and, uh, nope, nope. I couldn't diagnose it. Nothing to do it with. So I bought a computer online. And uh, I did some things to it. And I thought we'd fix it. And it was driving okay. So we took on another trip. Same thing happened. Flashing check engine light. This time I get home. And it did have, well, I can't remember which time. One time it had an idle air control valve uh, code. Yeah, so I got the I got the I got the code reader after the first flashing light. Read the codes, bad O2 sensor, bad idle air control valve. So I bought those online and it took a while for those to get here. Finally got that back together and I thought it was running better. It was still not idling right when you put it in reverse cold. 
still blah, 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 blah. So, well, it didn't fix it. But it's driving. So we went on a trip, came home, flashing light again. Uh, it goes into limp mode, so you can't go very fast. Got it home, parked it, and uh, so I changed the fuel filter, changed the air filter, uh, all, all things that needed to be done. So I didn't waste any money on that. But then I finally went back to the first thing that I thought of. I checked the spark plugs, the first thing, and they looked okay. And looked in, found an owner's manual online is the right spark plug. So I finally went back to that. So I'm gonna pull these in, and they looked a little dirtier this time. So I said, I'll go to Toyota. There's a brand new Toyota dealership here in Ormac City. So I went up there to buy some spark plugs. That's where I had the transmission serviced. I had never changed it, so I, I didn't really think of that. So handed them the spark plug, and they looked at it funny. And they said, what car? Toyota Wego. Toyota Wego. So they looked in the computer and looked. That's, the, that's not the right spark plug, sir. So they bring me out a completely different looking spark plug. Bring them home, install the spark plugs, boom, problem is solved. So now I've got a good running car and a good running little truck. Uh, before we come to America next year, we're going to sell both of those and get some more money back out of those. And it'll help us with our moving expenses. But the problem with owning a car, one of the problems with owning a car here in the field is if you need repairs, Finding a place where uh, you know they can fix the car and fix it right. Lots of mechanics here and lots of smart guys. They are smart mechanics. But they don't have fancy toolboxes like the mechanics do in America. Full of nice snap-on tools and diagnostic tools. They might have a, a two-gallon bucket with wrenches in it. <clears throat> and they're working on stuff, and they find ways to get it done. Yeah. They're resourceful. They're smart. They can figure out how to, how to fix things, usually. But sometimes they don't. And uh, but that's no different than America. Sometimes you take something to get it fixed, and they go, oh, yo, it needs a Conorier valve. So we put in a Conorier valve, and you drive it a couple days, and the problem comes back. So, um, but getting, if you do work yourself, or even for your own mechanic. So if you take your car to a mechanic, I had that trouble with my multi-cad, uh, and the carburetor was leaking fluid out the bottom of the accelerator pump. That's why it probably just needs a gasket. Um, so I took it to a, to a shop. I was going to let them do it. And uh, then he said, well, it's better just to replace the carburetor. So you go buy a carburetor, use one up, up here at the surplus place, and don't buy a new one. The new ones online are not any good. <laughs> Go up to the surplus place, buy a used carburetor, and come back and we'll put it on. They don't buy the parts. You have to go buy your parts if you want your car worked out. Uh, and not every place is going to have the parts you want. Plus, you have to take the part with you. So if I'm working on my brakes on the multi cab, I have to, the rear brakes and brake shoes. I have to take the brake shoes with me to the parts store so they can get the correct part. If you want a water pump, you got to take the water pump off of the engine, take it to the parts store, and make sure you get the right part. It was a good idea to take some calipers with you, whatever you need to check the, the part. Uh, I bought online a replacement for the rear hub on the Toyota Wego. Well, turns out. It's brand new. It looked exactly like the one I took off. Put it on. Doesn't fit. Um, the, the brake drum is rubbing against the back plate. So I said, man, what is wrong? Did I not put it back together right? What was it? So it turns out that one little part of the new hub was a few millimeters smaller, thinner, than the old one. And so it, it let the, the brake drum sit closer to the back plate. So I, I figured out a way, a trick around that. I just put some spacers in there and uh, it works. So just because you buy something online and it's brand new, even though it might say Toyota parts, 
A lot of fake stuff online here. So owning the car here is difficult. Buying the parts, finding someone to work on it. Um, if you're out in the middle of nowhere, it's, it's hard to get, get, get service. No tow trucks here in Ormoc City. So lots of, lots of things to, to learn and, and live with here. I, I don't want to go on too long um, because I'm already up to about 40 minutes here. But I enjoy it here. In spite of all the challenges I've met here, I really love living in the Philippines. If my wife didn't want to go back, go to America, I wouldn't go back. I like it here. I enjoy life here. I don't miss the snow or the ice. I don't miss people yelling at each other at the drive through drive through window or whatever, or McDonald's. Uh, I do miss the, the road rules. <laughs> Driving is better in America. But I like it here. But my wife wants to go to America, and I want her to be happy. I want her to experience America. I would like my family in America to meet my son and my wife. So that's what we're going to do. So I'll be making some more videos soon. Um, I've been going on and on here, and um, I'll try to make one. Try to make one every day if I can. Just sit here and flap my jaws for a while. So I'll close off here and I'll edit this video and post it for you. Thanks for watching. Tito Jeff, Remark City, Lakeland. Bye bye.